Hi, hello, hi. As I mentioned in my last video, uh, for the month of August, the reason why I hadn't uploaded as frequently as I usually do is because I was animating full-time. Um, I was hired by a university in Germany to animate a video about, don't want to say marine biology, it had a lot to do with plankton, I, do, I, I feel like it's kind of about marine life food chains? <laughs> anyway, um, I don't know how to explain it, but I certainly know what I animated. Um, so. It was great, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about it and also show you the animation in this video. Um, I'll put the timestamp of where the animation starts in the description if you would like to skip to the actual animation. You don't have to comment it like 45 times. It's okay, I'm good. it's in the description. Before I show the video, I kind of just wanted to have an introduction because I feel like it might be a little weird for me to post a video that is not voiced by me, that is about like plankton <laughs> and two aliens in space. You're gonna be like, was his account hacked? <laughs> But anyway, so the animation was written and voiced by the people who hired me. So they gave me the script and they gave me the voiceover and I made the animations to go along with their story. It was super cool and really challenging to be honest because there's a difference between animating something that you've written from start to finish that you know exactly what it's about, you know exactly what you're trying to say versus animating something that you don't know a whole lot about um, that someone else knows way more about um, and trying to get all those little details right, you know? So I had to learn a lot about phytoplankton and I just learned a lot of cool stuff. Um, but it was challenging in that sense that I was like, I don't know the difference between cyanobacteria and diatoms. So I had to like learn a lot of strange little tidbits of marine science, um, which added to it, honestly. It was, I love learning things and it was a great learning opportunity. The people I worked for were incredible, honestly. Like I think these are the nicest people who've ever commissioned me for anything ever. And yeah, that's the precursor to my animation. I just wanted to get a little bit of context before I just throw you in cold with the aliens and the phytoplankton and the voiceovers that are definitely not me. <laughs> and yeah, I hope you enjoy the animation and I don't know, maybe learn something or two. Please be nice. I would appreciate it. All right, thanks. Enjoy. There is a legend, the legend. Every living thing on the green planet P has heard about it and read the scriptures. The legend of the smallest of the small creatures, so small the eye cannot see them, who nonetheless run planet blue and have been adapting to a changing world for billions of years. Can it be true that these small creatures can withstand even unprecedented changes? And can it be true too that these creatures are just like Valentina and Emil, who are rather large by comparison and who keep life on their home planet P in perfect balance? Emil and Valentina have decided to go on a mission to planet blue. It is a good time for such an expedition as summer is coming to planet P and summers on P by the laws of physics last a century. They are bright, scorching and unforgiving. Can Valentina and Emil learn from creatures on the warming planet Blue and help their own species survive? Emil, look! Gosh, they are tiny! You don't say! And some of them are as green as us! Let me take a space scope sample and scan them into Spacypedia. Spacypedia says that these organisms are called phytoplankton. They do not sink, they do not float, they just coast along the currents, never knowing where life will take them next. Organisms? Did you say organisms? Unbelievable! Aren't they just too cute? And look at those ones. Boxes. Tiny rainbow-colored boxes. Spacypedia says they are known as diatoms on planet Blue. They seem to be rather common. Look, it is like they are forming a bloom. Oh, oh wow. They are dividing? And so fast. Small surprise then that there are so many of them. Amy, do your little eyes spy this too? There's our very favorite gas, CO2. Om nom nom. They are taking up CO2, like us, Emil. If they truly lived like we do. They should produce waste, right? And look what they are producing. Such tiny things, and yet they can photosynthesize. How is this possible? Are we not the only oxygen-producing species in the universe after all? What next? On P, we look after our planet. We make sure that there is harmony. We see to it that we do not overpopulate our planet, and so we don't even mind getting eaten. 
Is it really possible for these small creatures to rule planet blue? Fair enough, they make oxygen. But so far I have not yet seen any evidence for them to provide the foundation of life. And how are they supposed to be able to adjust to new conditions, small as they are? We need to keep looking. Here, there and there, they're moving, those ones over there. Yes, they have two flagella, one along the long side and one along the short side. It allows for slightly drunken spirally movement through the water. Amazing! They look like whip-driven spacecraft when you are in charge of piloting. <laughs> so much as to they don't know where they are going. Spacepedia has seen better days. Anyways, apparently they are called dinoflagellates. Let me just move the space scope a little bit, just a tiny little. What? No cyanobacteria. They seem to like it hot here. But what is that? Curious and curiouser. They have developed a taste for atmospheric nitrogen. So not quite like us, right? Hmm. Quite like us, after all. They also use CO2. So this means they make their own nutrients. Well, we don't have that kind of nutrient-making wool on P. Neither small wool nor large wool. We should ask them to come on board and take them home. That would solve a fair few of our issues. Yeah, great idea. What a nice souvenir from Planet Blue, too. And now what? What happened, Valentina? The cyanobacteria feel disinclined to acquiesce to our request. What? Why would they do that? Apparently it's a paradise down there. They say that not so long ago some fairly large bipeds emerged on the planet. The bipeds are not the smartest, calling a planet covered largely in water Earth, for example. But anyways, they have also produced copious amounts of CO2 that is now spread around the planet like a cloak. So it's getting hotter and hotter and the water's pH is dropping and dropping as a consequence. The cyanobacteria say that they love it and they are the new rulers of the planet. The conditions today remind them of similarly paradise-like conditions billions of years ago. They hope that all life will just give up and the planet will be theirs. <laughs> Goodness, how very selfish. We should land on planet blue and make friends with the bipeds. I bet they can't make nearly as much carbon dioxide as we can eat. Hmm, but shouldn't we warn the other small creatures we just found first? Yes, let's look for some more trustworthy little organisms. Emil, what do you think? These look any good? Not too bad. Can you establish a line of communication? Sure, they seem to be known as coccolithophores. And now? Well, for one they say that those bipeds won't last much longer unless they change their CO2-making, planet-heating ways, but that nobody else on the planet would really mind if they were gone. The coccolithophores are fairly laid back. In fact, they mercilessly mocked the cyanobacteria, saying no way will there be a new ruler of the oceans. The coccolithophores live in large populations and have fast cell division rates. You know what this means? They can rapidly evolve and therefore adjust as the environment changes. They fear neither the heat nor low pH. So they do not fear summer? Indeed not. Only here the heating is not caused by seasons that are passing but by climate change. We should ask them what we can do too, seeing we prefer to live long and prosper in small communities. Relying on large population sizes and fast evolution will not work for us. So are they really telling us that we can survive summer by cuddling? <laughs> it would seem so. And as we are diverse and cuddly as a community and spend much time in the sun where mutation rates speed up, we should hasten back and tell everyone on P. But wait, the legend! We still don't know how much the small organisms really are the caretakers of the planets. Is anyone actually using all that oxygen that they're making? Also, let's not forget about the bipeds. Shouldn't we keep one as a pet? A nice source of carbon dioxide always? We don't need any more pets on P. But you are right about the legend. We still don't know if all of it is true. Yikes! Skeletons? Dead things! What happened here? This is spooky. It is the dinoflagellates from the before. 
But they are red now. Oh, why is that? Are they angry? I don't know. Let me zoom in. No, but they produce toxins. Take that, herbivores. But Amy, do you know what that means? They get eaten. Come and take a look. I see. Now, look here. The diatoms are being eaten by some creepy, crawly... Copperpot. And the copperpots get eaten by smaller, not so small, fairly large, very large things with fins and gills. Fish. So it's true. The larger organism's survival hinges on the small organisms making oxygen and providing a food source. They truly are like us, just much, much smaller. Valentina and Emil bring the good tidings to P. Summer comes and life goes on. Yet they should have looked even more closely. They missed the picoplankton and bacteria and viruses, of which there are more than there are stars in the known universe.